I live in Norway, and although most horror movies I seem to watch are set in the States, there are some terrifying stories native to my own country that Hollywood directors should take more of an interest in. One of these so-called legends is that what you guys call the werebear. The origin of this creature differs depending on whom you talk to, but the main factors and elements always remain the same. A very long time ago, there was a tribe of people in the land who were believed to be part bear, part human. At the very least, bear sympathizers. They lived in caves alongside bears and wore bear skins. Not like a tracker who wore skins to show off how skilled he was at killing, but with pride to how their allegiance to the animals were. It is said that one day, these bear people kidnapped a young woman from the village and took her back to the cave where an actual bear took her as a wife and, well, consummated the marriage. The young woman bore several bear babies, which were of course half human, half bear. Now, you might be rolling your eyes at this point, but that's the lore. All was fine until one day, when the cubs supposedly wandered off, and somehow ended up in the village. When the people there saw this monstrosity, they killed it and armed themselves before heading off to the caves. A large, nasty, bloody battle ensued, and there were many, many deaths, including all of the bear children and the actual bear. Somehow, the young woman, who had fallen in love with the bear and her cubs, managed to escape successfully. So much was her grief and anguish that she made some sort of pact to be able to exact revenge. From then on, when the moon was at its fullest, she would return to the village and avenge the death of her cubs and family. This, of course, all allegedly happened hundreds of years ago. And again, it's what we call folklore, which is why a lot of people don't believe it exists. But the sightings of that angry mama and her revenge on the ancestors from the original village bloodline still exist to this day. And I should know, because my family are direct descendants of the original settlers, or so. This isn't just some fairy tale that has been passed down through generations, or an urban legend constructed to keep people away from lovers' lanes, or kids messing around in quarries. This is told to us as a warning, because too many people in my family line have died in terrible accidents for the curse not to be true. I should also make note that there is a very long line of heavy and dark black magic being practiced, at least on the male side. Many of the males on my family line were warlocks or the leaders of some witch coven. That much I do know. How much that has to be involved with the curse, I'm not exactly sure, but Knowing what little I do of magic, and all of that, I'm sure it can't contribute anything good. My great-grandfather, even, went to work and never came back, was found on the side of the road, presumed to be hit by a car, because cars are famous for leaving you with huge gouges in your chest. Grandfather took the dog for a walk. Dog came back, a leash all bloody. No granddad was found in the woods hanging. We presumed he'd hung himself due to fear of the curse, and of course, managed to rip both his arms off beforehand. Even, and this spit is hard, even my father. The police thought he must have disturbed an intruder. Maybe they were high, and that was why he ripped open his throat. So severely, he was almost decapitated. Are you seeing a pattern here? All male. Like the werebears punishing the men in my family as it was the men that had killed her family. The only thing I can hope for is that this generational curse doesn't come for me. So back in the days of playing Diablo 2, there was a character class called the Druid that was 
my first exposure to the concept of the werebear. I figured it was a fun idea and it was an offshoot of the werewolf that was like a game balancing thing that didn't have much basis in the actual lore. But then it also showed up in Lord of the Rings and a few other things here and there. But where was the inspiration for these ideas? So I found that a version of the werebear actually shows up in multiple cultures, including heathenry. In fact, the term berserker seems to be rooted in bear magic, suggesting that these warriors had some association with the bear. They show up in multiple legends and are always regarded as very powerful warriors, though not quite werebears. Procopius, a Roman historian during the rule of Justinian in the 6th century, describes ferocious pagan mercenaries from the Danish islands going into battle wearing nothing but shields and thick jackets, which is similar to descriptions of berserkers in later legends. But these, these men were likely part of a bear cult of sorts, fanatical warriors who might have channeled the land spirit or landvetir of the bear. There is, however, another story about a man who could become a bear. This particular story comes from the saga of Rolf Kraki, a king who was known for having a great retinue of champions. The greatest and most loyal warrior among them was a giant of a man named Bodvar Bjarki, who would lift a berserker in full armor off the ground with one arm and then slam him into the stone floor with such a force that the berserker just lay there. Bodvar's parentage is described in this saga as being rather peculiar. This is the story of a man named Bjorn, uh, which means bear, a name that's commonly adopted by heathens today after their conversion. Bjorn was a prince in Norse legend of a kingdom in the far north of Norway. The king, his father, had remarried after the queen, Bjorn's mother, had died. He married a woman named Fit, but Fit was very young and the king very old. And the marriage it didn't go well. Bjorn eventually fell in love with his childhood friend, Bera, which also means bear, by the way. She was the daughter of a wealthy freeman in the kingdom who had amassed great wealth through raiding. And they would meet each other often as they grew up. And Bjorn would become large and strong and skillful in combat and whatever else he would set his mind to. But when the king would travel, he would leave the queen, Fit, now Bjorn's stepmother, in charge. She was terrible at it, but she had no idea that this was the case. She was under the impression that she was damned excellent at it, which we all know the type. The queen suggested to the king that the next time that he went out raiding, Bjorn should rule with her. That way, she can train him for the job in the future. The king thought that this would be productive, but Bjorn had little liking for the idea, much because he just didn't have much liking for the queen, as she had become arrogant and overbearing. But the king forced the issue after a massive argument over the matter. Bjorn would stay behind and rule with the queen as the king left with his great army to go raiding. Bjorn went to his quarters and remained there for a time. The queen came to comfort him, but Bjorn wasn't interested and told her to leave, which she respected. Over the next few days, though, the queen was very nice to Bjorn and eventually floated the idea of sharing a bed to make their time together more exciting and interesting while the king was gone. Bjorn responded to this by promptly slapping her and throwing her out of his quarters. This enraged the queen. She stated clearly that she was not accustomed to being rejected and added that it seems that you, Bjorn, prefer the embrace of a commoner's daughter to that of a queen, and you must suffer a disgraceful punishment. She used her sorcery to turn him into a cave bear and cursed him to live with an undying hunger. He would have to kill more than any other bear in order to simply survive, forced to hunt on his father's livestock and wander the woods in his disgrace, and he would never be released from this spell and he would be aware of his disgrace for the rest of his haunting existence. And Bjorn disappeared. The king and his men went out and searched for him, but he was nowhere to be found. But it was said that in the land there was a large and ferocious gray bear that was killing the king's livestock in great number, and something needed to be done. One day, Bera witnessed the bear killing livestock. The bear saw her, and approached unthreateningly. She was frozen in fear as the animal dwarfed her in size, but as it approached, she thought she could recognize Bjorn's eyes in the bear. Once she had collected herself, she did not run away. The beast turned away from her and walked into the forest. And Bera could not help but follow through the woods, 
until night fell and she reached a great cave. She cautiously entered the cave and found a man who greeted her. She recognized Bjorn and ran to him to embrace him. And for a time, they stayed together until Bjorn told her it was not right for them to stay together. The curse was unbreakable. And he would be a beast by day, even if he became a man again at night. So here we see the dictate of werebear lore, whereas in popular werewolf lore, the moon holds sway. But in werebear lore, the sun is what holds sway. As dawn approaches, Bjorn turns into a massive cave bear filled with bloodlust, but at sunset, he returns to manhood, haunted by the memories of his actions. Before morning, Bjorn explained to Bera that he had left three treasures for his sons in the cave guarded with magical runes. Bera was confused as they didn't have children, but Bjorn insisted their children would be unruly and strong and would take great care to raise but to bring them back to the cave when they were of age to claim their inheritance, highlighting that even through a curse, Bjorn would make sure to provide for his family. The next day, the bear form came over Bjorn and he left the cave. Bera followed him for a distance and saw him encircled and killed by the king's hunters. Bera was taken to the castle where a great feast was held and to Bera's shock, the main course was the bear. The queen forced her to sit at the table while the king and his subjects ate the flesh of his son. And the queen asked if Bera was hungry, and Bera simply said no. The queen accused her of rudeness and cut off a piece of the meat and forced her to eat two bites of the bear meat before Bera ran from the hall, and the queen just laughed. Bera escaped, but she found herself pregnant with three sons, and the bear meat had deformed two of her sons to have animal features because she had taken two bites of it, though she was forced. But Bodvar Bjarki was healthy. The saga follows all three of these sons, who go on to accomplish great things. But it focuses on Bodvar, who becomes a champion of the court of Rolf Kraki and proves himself to be a great warrior. At the end of the saga, King Rolf Kraki and his champions come under attack. The battlefield is chaotic, as it's a surprise attack. And Bodvar cannot be found. And yet, there is a giant bear on the battlefield, standing by the king, guarding him, tearing apart his enemies. The saga of King Hrolf Kraki is a magical story filled with events such as these. I highly suggest that heathens pick it up and give it a read. It's medieval writing from a Christian monk, of course, and as such, it reads that way. There's... Some other stories in the saga that I'd love to cover, uh, including the adventures of Bodvar Bjarki and his brothers. Let me know in the comments below if you want to see more storytelling videos like this. I had a lot of fun with this, and I hope you did too. And I think it's important for us heathens to dig around our sagas and tell these stories to each other. Because we are the keepers of our sagas now, and the storytelling is important to our faith. The other um, interesting and, and really powerful relationship that ties into the calling of the bear walker, which you taught us all, is the relationship between the husband and the wife and how the sisters band around her, but she's in a very difficult relationship uh, and something happens for those of you who haven't seen the film, but for those of you that have, how difficult was it for you to write those scenes? Um, well, first of all, you have to ask permission to write anything about bear walking. You have to go see the elders and ask permission about, you know, what, what, what you can share and what you cannot share. Um, it's, it's difficult to write about bear walking because you're not sure of what, what could happen. And Somewhere along the way, maybe I, I had lost sight of it and I got bear walked myself. And being bear walked is really something that could actually really kill you, you know, and without the help of, you know, your elders and your medicine people, you know, there's no way 
you can get out of it unless you have this help behind you. So it was very difficult for me to write those scenes because I was unsure whether it was going to repeat itself. So, so I always had to be, I always had to have medicine with me. And my mother made me a medicine pouch with tobacco in it and, and it was preyed on. And that's what I wore throughout the day when, I were, when we were shooting Bear Walker. And we, we said our, we did our smudges, you know, with, with the crew and everything. People need to understand what we were dealing with. And I mean, the whole shoot was, went smooth. I think it went smoothly anyways, you know, except for that first day when my producers were cooking breakfast for everybody because our cook didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Um, one of the, um, it, it, the the film is a spectacular film. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you work with cinematographer, with your cinematographer, your director of photography, how you create your the, sort of the visual language or what how you want it shot? How did you work together with uh, with Jonathan Barker on that? Well, to be honest, it was a very difficult journey with, with, with the cinematography of the film because he was not available to me. You know, he didn't make himself available until maybe four days before the shoot. So it was a, a difficult time. So we were actually, you know, doing a lot of the rehearsal of the cinematography during the shoot. And, and sometimes they did not understand exactly what I wanted to, to do with it. So, I mean, now, like, I've learned my lesson from it, you know, and make sure that my cinematography is there for me now, because if they're not there for me, I, I'm, I'm easy to let them go. But this was my first project. So, you know, you were always, you know, walking on eggshells because you didn't know if you said something that the whole crew would fall apart or, you know, the actors would fall apart. You know, so it, it, was, a, it was a shoot that where it was very difficult for me. But now I would never let that happen again. Um. How important was casting for you? You have some really fabulous actors. What was the casting process like for you? And how did you choose those particular actors to play those really significant roles? Well, like I said at the beginning that the, the story around these sisters were based on real true stories. So when you already have the characters in your in your mind, you know you want to be authentic to those sisters as well, and so and that and that was the um, the process that I used to cast the the um, the, the four sisters. So in, we went like I don't know Vancouver, across to the states, whatever, trying to find these four sisters, and and it uh, and we ended up like. Um, trying to cast like Tammy and Ruby at one time and and um and because the the um funders so oh god I can't even remember the, the funders names are but they were from from New York and uh offline, offline. offline. Entertainment. entertainment yes so I was um I was I said you know like I asked my sister Greta if she would audition for Tammy and she said, sure. So I, I auditioned her, but I was also playing Ruby on the other side of the camera. And uh, because Offline said that they would not finance the film if I were to act and direct the film. And so as I was um, auditioning Greta, you know, we sent it off to New York and then you phoned me and said, are you sitting down? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I could sit down. And you, and you told me that um, <laughs> offline said that whoever is reading with Tammy is your Ruby. And it was me. And so that's how I got to be in the film. 
but we read so many people for Ruby too, and it, it just didn't work out somehow. I guess it was meant to be that I would play Ruby. <laughs> and the film has played, you know, all over the world, and uh, especially with uh, indigenous audiences, it has such impact. Why do you think the film means so much and has such a, a big influence with your community? I think because a lot of people can relate to it. They can relate to the sisters, they can relate to the story, they could relate to the cops, they could relate to almost everything that's happening in the film. There are people who have been bear walked who came up to me and said I was bear walked and told me their story and said it was so close to what I what I was doing in the film. But with, with, um, with the lawyer being it, they asked me, why is there a lawyer in it? I have a mentor that passed away, Tom Pelche. He wrote a book called Bear Walker. And he had a lawyer in his, in, his, in his book. I asked him if I could use a lawyer in my film. And he said, why? He said, why don't you just make my, my film, you know, like out of, out of his book? And I said, I already wrote this story, right? <laughs> and he said, well, you can use the lawyer. And that's how the lawyer came to be in the script. But I know that my community uh, uh, have, you know, have embraced the film in many ways because of that, that they, they re relate to it so well. A lot of people said, yeah, you know, that's how Indians speak, you know. That's how, you know, that's how it is on the res, you know, so they, they were able to, to um, relate to it. And with the Cree, I'm telling you, up in Quebec, James Bay, you know, they were just, everybody was watching it up there. They're still watching it. And I still get these requests, you know, where, you know, where can I buy Bear Walker? Where can I, where can I see it? You know, because of the Cree that's in it. The film, it, you know, it's, a, it's a really a, a beautiful and a fabulous first film, but it was also a bigger project because it was shot in the community, which you demanded, and, but you also um, connected youth. Can you talk a little bit about that process and, and what the film and the, and the team provided to the community and the youth and how the film became a bigger um, event in, in the community? I, as a youth myself growing up, you know, I always had to leave home to, to find the resources to be able to, to, to teach myself on, on, um, on, on what I want, wanted to be as an artist. I just wanted to be an artist. And, and as I was growing up, there were never ever resources in my community to help me. And I, and I said, that's why I said, I want to shoot Bear Walker on the reserve. And I, I, I think there was 27 youth that worked on the film. And, and when, the, when, the, um, when the film was complete, the, um, the youth kept coming back to me. When are you doing your next film? When you, you know, it takes a long time, especially as an Aboriginal, the filmmaker it takes a long time to make a film and I and I kept saying to them I don't know when I'll be making my next film because I you know I have to get financing I have to do all this stuff and then and then I said to myself why don't I just bring the resources to these kids why don't I just you know bring it here so I went to Sundance I went to you know the film center in in in, um, in Toronto, a woman in the director's chair, you know, I, and, then, and then I thought I could put all this together and put, put together a training center for all, all, the, all these youth that want to make films and get their voices and their stories out there. You know, they're hearing stories. They know they cannot keep them. They have to pass them on. And today, 
you know, everything is about the media. Look at us right now, you know, it's all about media. And this is the really best place for these students and these young people to put their voices out there, put it out on film. And a lot of them are pretty shy, you know, and so when they're shy like that, you know, at least the film, the media speaks for them. Tanya Horak sent another comment for you to respond to. Were there any films that influenced you in making Bear Walker? And she says, I was interested in the extent to which you saw the film as a rewriting of the rape revenge tradition. The film really stands out of its intersexual understanding of gender, race, class, and sexual violence. So were there any films that influenced you and 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 how did you come to articulate sort of the rape rape uh, revenge theme? Um, I, I wouldn't say that there was films that influenced me. I'm I, I mean, I read a lot of Sam Shepard stuff. I love Sam Shepard stuff, and he he was my influence in writing a lot of my work. Um, because what he was writing is so like what is happening in my community. And that was where my influence came from. So it, 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 it actually didn't come from any films at all. I just, I just concentrated more on what people were saying and how people are saying things on the reserve. I'm always observing people, you know, finding characters in my own community, you know, to use because I'm telling you, you know, the, any, any reserve has many characters that, that young people can use. And I, and I try to teach them here that your characters are right there living in front of you. You know, some, because some of my students want to write, you know, Star Wars. They want to write all this other stuff, you know. And I tell them, you know, go, go back to your community. Your community has the stories that you can actually um, portray and, and, and um, get it out to the audience. And, you, and, and your voice will also, you know, inspire other young people to, to do the same. Um, anyway, just the, 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 the cop was kind of had this obsession with, with her and her husband uh, was so abusive and then she called the bear walker. So how did you play? Were, were they all sort of representative of different people or was it sort of representative of one theme of violence and, and, the, and the response to that violence? the um the violence like in the film is is sort of um when you get into the into the into the space of the bear walker violence is is a thing that they actually can put into you into you into you as you're being bear walked and this family in particular, when one person is bearwalked in a, in a family, everybody is affected by it. Um, and so everything comes with it and everything that is really evil comes with the bear walker. And so we, I know that there was a lot of um, things that I had to take out of the film, which is even more violent of the bear walker that we did, we did not see in this film. And so, and, and the only way sometimes you have to fight the bear walker is to embrace it somehow, you know, and which is what the, the lawyer does. She embraces it to try to save her family. So she needs, she wants to fight the bear walker, but the old medicine man stops her because that is not the way to do it. 
And so, so the, the violence just increases from the moment we see El Ali and as, she, as she moves through, you see all the violence that she, she has to encounter where eventually it kills her. And it kills her because her sister did not, in, did not go in the, in the right direction of, the, of, of what you're supposed to do when you're being Berwa. She went and embraced it. Makwamosa, The Bear Walker Cult, an Indian legend by Dennis Michael Morrison. This appeared first in Indian Artifact Magazine way back in 1991. The Indian people of North and South America have what is, in my opinion, the most colorful culture that has ever existed on old planet Earth. Mythology and legend has always been, and continues to be, a very large part of that culture. Despite beautiful relics made by hand and left behind for us to discover and admire, their fantasy world is, to me, the most interesting thing about them. And the Indians' legends and myths are revealed to us much about the Indian mind. Here in Michigan, we have the wonderful Hiawatha legends. These feature such unique characters as the trickster, Manabazo, and the great hair called Mishibao, and the dark and evil one, the Windigo, who were cannibal giants. It is said that many legends have a basis in truth. This could be true of the Wendigos. Here in Greenbush, Michigan, were found the remains of human beings of extremely large size and antiquity. It's also no longer any secret that cannibalism was practiced to a degree in the Great Lakes region. There is a legend from this area that is a little known and quite mysterious. It is a legend of a dark secret power that was used in antiquity and still weaves its web today. This is the power of the Makwamosa, or the Bear Walker cult. It is claimed that this is the Indian equivalent of white man's witchcraft. Recently, I was granted a videotaped interview with Mr. John Naganigan, who is chief of the local Mikado Indian Reservation. With some apprehension, Chief Naganigan related to me his memories of this evil subject. This article is based on what he related in that interview. The Bear Walker cult used the powers to settle grudges. The power of the Makwamosa is not used against whites. It is only for Indian against Indian. Chief Naganigan said that the practitioners were very sly indeed. In modern times, cult members would pose as good Christian churchgoers but would be doing the devil's work on the side. The power imbued in modern practitioners comes down from ancient times as it has been passed from one generation to another. The manner of transfer is quite simple. When an Indian with the power feels that he or she nears death's door, they call to themselves kinsmen and simply tell that person, I have something for you. The power cannot be refused and the power must be used. By using the bear walker powers to, or the possessor must kill at least one person per year or the power will turn on its possessor and kill him or her. Among other things, the person with power can transform themselves into any shape that they so desire. Most frequently, the choice is that of a bear. In this form, they stalk forth to revenge wrongdoings <clears throat> done to themselves or kinsmen, and they have a tremendous power indeed. If in this form they even pass by an innocent bystander, that person, unless extremely strong in constitution, is knocked unconscious by the sheer power concentrated in this being. Closely connected with the bear walker are bright lights. When a person transforms uh, into the bear walk, they walk upright through the forest <clears throat> in search of its victims. The beast is ablaze with brilliant lights. At times, one of the more common shapes to be assumed is that of huge fireballs. The chief recalled one evening watching from the barn by his house. I remember one going down to the woods by, by my house. You could just see the trees all light up. There is protection, however. Whether you be an innocent or the sought-after party, if you possess a little slyness yourself, when you have spotted the bear walker coming down the trail, you, you must double back. And when you double back, you must take a pinch of sand from the trail where it has walked and place this in your lip. It is said that this kills the power of the beast. At the Mikado Reservation, there lived 
uh, a woman practitioner. Her name need not be mentioned. At any rate, another elderly Indian has told me that he and his brothers were walking through the woods one day and they saw a bear walker coming down the path. They got sly, as they would say, and hid off the side of the path. They leapt upon the beast as it passed. The beast was spitting fire and fighting like crazy, but it finally gave up. The monster turned into the woman mentioned um, above and begged for her release, which they granted. The legend of the bear walker is vague. Oftentimes, as it is uh, being discussed, the story is contradictory. But then the Indians seem to, um, to be great storytellers. Still in all, it is believed in our area of Michigan by the Native Americans. One of the things that cannot be denied, and that is by their legends and stories handed down generation to generation, the Native Americans were indeed a superstitious people. Those here in my area were not and are not now an exception to that. People talk a lot about good and evil. Some say that no one is born bad. It's just a result of the way they were raised. But that's not what my ancestors believed. Some beings, some animals and people, and those who are both human and animal at the same time, are at gaunt, twisted away from the path of the good mind. All they care for is power, and they're always hungry, the way he is. Did I hear a twig crack? I listen, but I don't hear anything. And that is not such a good sign. On a night like this, when the moon is bright enough for me to see the pages of my notebook and write in them, there are usually sounds in the woods, unless something big is out there hunting. Then everything gets this quiet, as quiet as I am trying to be. Quiet enough that the bear walker won't find me. My uncle Jules told me about the bear walker. Long ago, he said, there was a Mohawk village. One day people began to disappear. They would go out hunting or to work in the fields and never return. Were enemies ambushing them? Was it some big animal that attacked silently and then carried off their bodies? No one knew. Then one day a hunter found something that filled him with fear. He ran back to the village to tell everyone. I saw the tracks of a huge bear, he said. We've all seen bear tracks before, another hunter said. What is so special about bear tracks? Ah, uh, the first man said, a shiver of fear going down his back as he spoke. These were no ordinary tracks, for as I followed them, they became the tracks of a man. A long silence descended upon the people. They all understood now why people had been vanishing. They knew now what creature had come to prey upon their people. It was the one they called a monster bear. One of those atgant beings, neither human nor animal, but a terrible mixture of both. It could take the form of a human, or the shape of a great bear. But unlike a real human or bear, it lived only for blood and death. Perhaps this creature had once been a human, but his lust for power had been so great that he had done the things needed to transform him into a monster bear. One of those things, and this sent a chill down my back when Uncle Jules whispered the words, was to sacrifice the life of one of his own relatives. When it seemed human, the monster bear spoke with a voice that was pleasing, so pleasing that it would confuse those who heard it, and they would follow this tall, attractive human without thinking, follow him even though he held one hand over his mouth as he spoke, and when he smiled, he did so with his mouth closed. This was because, even when in the shape of a man, the creature still had the long, sharp canine teeth of a bear. And when that person who had been entranced by the monster's sweet voice had been led deep enough into the forest, then that awful being would suddenly turn and leap with an awful roar. All that would be left of that unfortunate victim would be the bones that the monster bear would carry back to its lair. It piled up those bones and slept upon them as a bed. The villagers had all heard the stories of this gaunt bear creature, but had not encountered one until now. Finally, the head clan mother spoke. Her voice was sad. Now we know what has happened to our people who vanished, she said. 
they have surely been devoured by that unclean being. But this is not the time to become lost in sorrow. We must do something and not just wait to be victims. She looked around the circle of anxious faces. What can we do? said the leader of the hunters. If the stories about this creature are true, then its skin is too tough for our arrows or spears to pierce it. No weapon can kill it. If we go out to hunt it, it will just hunt us instead. Suddenly a small voice spoke up. I have an idea, said that small voice. Everyone turned to look at the one who had said those words. It was the littlest boy in the village, the one almost everyone ignored. His parents had died and he lived with his aged grandmother in a little patched-up longhouse. Although she loved her grandson, she was so old that her eyes were no longer good, so she did not notice that the boy's hair was never combed and that his face and clothes were never washed. In fact, his buckskin shirt and his blanket were full of holes. The name his parents had given him was Atandas, which means listener. But everyone in the village just called him by the nickname of Dirty Face because of the way he looked. One of the hunters laughed at the boy. What do you know? said the hunter. You are just a little boy with ragged clothing. Others joined in the laughter, but the laughter ended suddenly when the head clan mother held up her hand. Let the boy speak, she said. I have seen how he sits by the fire, listening when stories are told. Those holes in his clothing have come from the sparks that leap out from the fire. He listens so closely that he does not even brush those sparks away. Little Dirty Face stood up and stepped forward. I remember it being said in the stories that if someone challenges the monster bear to a race and wins, he may be able to destroy it. The people looked around at each other and nodded their heads. It was true. That was what more than one story said. Good, said the head clan mother. This young one has spoken well. Now... Who among us will be the one to race that creature? Once again there was a long silence. None of the men lifted their heads to speak up. Even the leader of the hunters stared down at his own moccasins. If no one else will do this, a little voice finally said, then I will try to do it. I will challenge the monster bear. It was, of course, Atandas, the boy everyone called Dirty Face, and this time no one laughed at him. The boy went out and did as he said he would do. When the bear walker came to him in the shape of a man, he saw it for the monster it was. He challenged it and the race began. For four days he pursued it, making a fire each night and sitting with his back to the fire for safety. At last, the bear walker couldn't run no farther. It fell to the ground exhausted, right in front of the cave where the piled bones of its victims lay. Atandas lifted up his bow to shoot the monster. As he did so, the bear walker laughed. Your arrow cannot kill me, it snarled up at him. My skin is too thick. Shoot it, and then I will rise up and kill you and gnaw the flesh from your bones. I imagine that boy standing there, his bow drawn back, his arrow pointed at the bear walker. The smell of death and decay comes out of that cave where the bones of the monster's victims lay piled in a great heap. The bear walker's teeth are long and sharp. Atandas can see the hunger in its eyes, but his hands do not shake. I know your weakness, Atandas says. Your heart is hidden behind that white spot on your body. Then he shoots his arrow. That story I loved so much as a child has become all too real to me now. But I'm not the boy in that old story who could run forever without tiring. I don't have a bow and arrow, no weapons at all, and my hands are shaking as I write this. Like I said, I've never done this before, so I'm still getting used to the format and finding my voice. I will eventually find a way to make it my own. Ooh, excuse me. Ooh. <clears throat> my own. Okay. Okay. So, it's called the Black Magic 
murders. Now, like I said, I've never heard of this. Now, I grew up with a neighbor who told me all manner of urban legends, mythology, were very, very into Indian culture, especially the nearby Indian culture, because I grew up in Henderson, Nevada, and the culture around there was very different. So the fact that I'd never heard of this before, or maybe I did and I forgot, I'm going to give myself a little bit of that, but I do not ever remember coming across any of this, which mind you, the most recent case was in 2018. I'll get to it in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me? All right, let's get into this because you'll be, you'll be, have, you'll have a lot more questions than answers. And I still have a lot of unanswered questions, so this is unresolved for me as well. Anyway, so let's get started. The article that I'm getting this from, which some of it is directly quoted, just because I didn't want it to lose its charm, I will copy the link below to find the said article that I'm paraphrasing and or quoting. It is from August 1950. Just to give you a context, August of 1950, in a log cabin or log house, in a hardwood clearing of forgive my pronunciation, this is also in Ontario, Canada, so I don't know French. <laughs> Sheguanda, sorry, uh, Indian Reservation, 40 yards back from the Blue Lake Montu. I hope I said that right. Okay. Though abandoned for five years, not even the kids would approach to throw rocks at the house. They wouldn't even play pranks or go near the house. People, the locals, would go out of their way to take the long way around in the marshland, in the bushland, to get away from this house. They did not have to be anywhere near it, just to give you an idea of this house. Okay? It's called the Bear Walker House. Now, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with bear walking or the bear walk curse, but I was totally unfamiliar with this until I read this, so I've only known about it for like two weeks. Okay. So, it was called the Bear Walk House of Death. That was the full moniker for it. Um, the Indians on the island preferred to take detours because of the history of this house. It has a very bloody history. From patricide to witches to unexplained lights floating around. Um, and a blind witch doctor who saw visions in smoke. Devil statues made of clay and other nefarious rumors that were believed to be true. The front yard of this seemingly haunted property um, was where James... I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong again. If anyone's familiar with this case, please... <laughs> How do you pronounce this guy's name? Okay, so Newigizik. N-E-H-W-E-G-I-Z-I-K. Sorry, it's an <clears throat> interesting name. <laughs> okay, where James shot his father to death and aimed the rifle in the direction of his mother, but was unable to find her because he believed that they both had cast the bear walk curse on him. Okay. After some research, the bear walk is a very scary, very serious curse. Okay. It's very, very serious. Um, the bear walk spirit is a malignant devil summoned out of the wilderness by an evil person or supposed evil person. Once 
in the victim, it is said to create misfortune leading to death. Leading to death. <laughs> so, one example would be a pregnant woman uh, giving birth to a stillborn. Okay? It was said that in order to summon the demon, a witch would need to chew a mixture of herbs, then spit the mixture in the path of the accursed. The origin of this legend has been woven into not just Canada's Native American culture, but all throughout North America. Of course, there are variations depending on which area you go and which Indian you speak to or which tribe you speak to. But it is said to have begun with, with a witch called the Great Black Bear from the forest where evil spirits would carry children into the night. Yikes. <laughs> okay. So the story of Alec, who is James's father, was presented to the Supreme Court in Ontario before... Okay, Okay. anyway, it was presented to the Supreme Court. I couldn't read my chicken scratch, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so... Many newspapers and media outlets completely glazed over this story because their assumption was that it was a crazy Indian going berserk. So they completely ignored it and didn't really find him to be a credible uh, or viable person in this case. They had no... they didn't believe him, pretty much. They said, oh, killed his father, whatever. Just toss him in some kind of psychiatric or jail or something like that and just call it a day because he's not credible because it's kind of how they took it at that time believe it or not there's been a very long period of time in which there was serious prejudice against Native Americans and this was not just in the United States this was in many areas of the world where the native people were persecuted, or judged, or completely glazed over and ignored. So hearing this, it's very sad, but at the same time, it kind of makes sense. Okay, so the next part of it, Jim testified that his parents spit in his path using pig's hair, twigs, and herbs upon his head. Surely, he was forced to kill his parents. You know, he, he was forced to do it. They put a curse on him. He had no choice. He had to kill them. That's just how he thought. Okay, and then <laughs> my favorite part of this whole story is Lawrence. The star witness, Lawrence Tulleur, Tulleur, Tulleur? Sorry, I can't pronounce it right. I'm sorry. Anyway, so, the star witness was a blind witch doctor. Then, Seventeen flatly told a flabbergasted courtroom he had smoke in his, he had smoked in his, ritual, in his ritual pipe where the smoke had presented him the sight in his sightless eyes that he had seen Alec and Harriet, James's parents, have indeed put the bear walk curse on Jim. I'm sorry. What? I would love to be in that courtroom during this time because a blind man saw something in the smoke? Whoa. <laughs> How? How did that happen? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know either. So Cooper, a man defending Jim, stated the following. Jim, 33, with heavy shoulders on a short slender body with a prominent jaw and prominent jaw and furrowed forehead. In the spring of 1945, he returned to his parents' home on the Rose after working during the winter in a lumber camp. A north 
Oh, the North Shore Lake of Huron. Okay, the interaction between him and his parents were cordial, and as he came back downstairs from unpacking, he handed his dad $50. Okay, so early spring came and went with no work. He had two choices, either stay home with his parents or to go out and find other work. Of course, Jim didn't want to stay home, though. So, he went out, he went out to the port and watched the sailboats. Okay. On another note, um, they had interviewed Carl, Carl Atkinson, which was, he was a farmer that he would normally employ uh, James. So, he described him as not too bright, but hardworking. Okay. Now, at this point, <laughs> during this period, Jim is wholeheartedly convinced that his mother is feeding him a love potion, because he's 33, unmarried, and kept having these dreams about beautiful young women. And he awoke with bloody noses most of the time. Sure. Okay. In early June, he explains of excruciating headaches. And rumors are spreading around that his mother is a witch. By July, he confronted his parents, where they explained... Oh. Okay. He confronted his parents after hearing them discuss how much they thought of an idiot he was. He may not have been very smart, but he knew how to stand up for himself. He proceeded to grab all of his things and stormed out to live with his aunt and his cousin. Now, in his cousin and his aunt, specifically his aunt, he found an ally. Someone who was just as superstitious and believed in the same things as he did. He was very, very adamant that his mom was a witch. And not too long in this day, his aunt proceeded to explain that she must have been a witch. Why? Because she explained to him that her father, on his deathbed, said that she put the bear walk curse on him, on his deathbed. <sighs> That's some intense stuff right there. <laughs> okay, so his aunt claimed to see lantern lights floating around. Jim knew how to stave this thing off, and it was a gun. But lo and behold, alas, he did not have one. So where does he go? What do you do when you don't have a gun? What do you do? Well, you go to your former employer and ask for a loaner gun. I don't know why he did it, but Atkinson lent him the gun. Okay. Well, let's see how this one pans out. Can anybody guess what's going to happen? <laughs> All right. So, early August, came along, and allegedly, the bear walker had been seen by his cousin, who was in the form of a dog on the porch. So, Jim went out to shoot it, and it vanished. It didn't whine, it didn't cry out, it just vanished. Okay, and now we enter the blind witch doctor. This has got to be my favorite part. Okay, so, Jim paid a fee. Pipe, tobacco, matches, and a $4 bottle of liquor. The pipe, tobacco, and matches belonged to the person to be bewitched. I'm assuming the liquor was for a tip. Okay, so Lawrence, the blind witch doctor, proceeded to predict that indeed his parents were scheming to kill him. Lawrence pleaded for Jim 
to tread very carefully and prescribed herbs and after the ceremony his aunt used broken glass to cut a cross into his forehead and shove them in with cheesecloth. The treatments were ineffective. Anybody surprised? I'm not. So he jumped up and that's when he ran and confronted his, his dad specifically, shot him through the neck where he died on the on the front grass, front lawn, and his mom escaped through the back door. She never returned, by the way. She was very smart. Okay. Another tidbit of information is the fact that this was seen to be a form of revenge or restitution due to the fact that his father had killed his own brother on the property, not even a few yards away from where his father had passed away. So in his mind, or the court assumed in his mind, this was his way of seeking revenge for his uncle. Now, despite the fact that this sounds absolutely fucking insane, um, Jim was observed to be a totally different person between what other prisoners had said they witnessed and by the psychiatrist who spoke with him, that he was observed to be calm, natural, and not insane, and he was found to be competent. Which is bonkers. He was still incarcerated. <laughs> I don't see any other information about it. So, there were two other cases. Now, in the area, specifically in Canada, there were three cases total in which they used the Bear Walker curse as a way to cop out, pretty much. There was one in 2017 where a man c committed aggravated assault and then tried to use the Bear Walker curse. But he was found to be bloody insane, completely. Not all there. And then the second one was in 2018 where they tried to use the Bear Walker curse and they, fa they were found to be competent, but they didn't see any correlation between the Bear Walker curse and him committing the crime. So those are fairly recent. I mean, two, three years. But if I had just left it at 1950, you'd probably say, that's probably a myth. But, when you find that there are cases specifically in Canada that are leading up to 2018, hmm, interesting. Now, I couldn't find very much information about the Bear Walk Curse. It doesn't appear as much as I thought it would, especially after it being a curse, especially in in that culture, I would assume that a lot more people would bite on it because it sounds very interesting. And even the information that I got from this had more about the murder and less about the curse. So if you find anything, or if you're from this area in Canada, which is Ontario, Canada, by the way, and you want to supplement some of the information, let me know. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, like I said, I'm still trying to find my voice with some of this stuff, but this was so much fun. If you guys have any other cases, let me know. A number of years ago, I published a video here about the Maquamosa, also known as the Bear Walker. The video was based on an interview I had in the late 1980s with Chief John Agonigan of the Mikado, Michigan settlement. Recently, a viewer here on YouTube, Iris, and I don't want to mispronounce her name, but it's spelled W-I-G-L-E, Wiggly, uh, wrote a series of very interesting comments to me about the Bear Walker. I think you'll enjoy her observations. <clears throat> so this following <clears throat> was related to me by Iris. I quote, 
There may be a difference between the bear walker and a skinwalker. I'm not sure. It is said that a skinwalker has the power to feel the prey. There may be a door between them or a bridge, but the bear walker knows what type of a person or animal is waiting to pounce. Imagine a cloud, a spirit, ascending upon the bear walker. The bear walker can feel every movement that is going on behind the door. It may be that two spirits have become one, or the spirit of the bear walker descended uh, upon the evil ones and came back to report how many. A club or gun, flamethrower or pitchfork, a uh, man or woman, right? See, the skinwalker sits inside a person, and the bear walker can actually mimic each movement at the same time, whether the person is combing the hair or lighting a cigarette. The movements of hunter and prey will be the same. Bible prophecy tells us that in the future there will be 144,000 humans of um, every tribe upon the earth to rule, to judge, and to be put to death. Will they answer, will they all be bear walkers or skin walkers, I wonder? Jesus knew the Bible tells us exactly what the hunters were doing and thinking, and he escaped many times. Some will argue that the Holy Spirit of God is a powerful force, and that maybe uh, a human may conclude that it is a skinwalker spirit that has come uh, to the aid of, of the prey, and that the hunted will step back from the door because the Holy Spirit is repelled by evilness. Possibly two different types of skinwalkers, little skinwalkers and big skinwalkers. The Holy Spirit can also use the synopsis of, of an animal. We see this with the uh, plagues upon Egypt. We see these when Elijah was thrown into the lion's den and the lions kept him warm, but the hunters, they instantly killed. The Holy Spirit can motivate in the millions, whereas the earthly skinwalker can do only one thing at a time. God took away the re uh, rebellious angels' ability to change into humans, but he did allow ranking angels to continue in power to some extent for him to use at will. A bear walker turning from human to animal would have to be a very high-ranking angel, and the power to do so had been approved by God to, many way of, to, me, to my way of thinking. Perhaps it was not just a man that was being hunted or uh, on the Pine Ridge Reserve. Uh, end quote. I need to point out something here. I want to stop here for a moment. Iris uh, tying in the, the bear walker and skin walker into the biblical framework is <clears throat> something that I had never considered and is fascinating to say the least. Now, Iris also made mention of the Pine, uh, Pine Ridge Reserve, and I feel as though I should give you some background which is significant to the discussion here. According to Wikipedia, the Pine Ridge Reservation is an Ogla, uh, Oglala, uh, Lakota Native American Indian Reservation located in South Dakota. Pine Ridge was established in 1889. Now some of what I'm about to relate to you may seem off base, but I feel it's important here to understand the site's tragic history. A mesa in what is today the Oglala administered portion of the Badlands National Park. It was there that the last of the ghost dances took place. The U.S. authorities attempt to repress this uh, movement eventually led to the true horror that we know as the Wounded Knee Massacre, where the young, the elderly, the women, children, men were all mercilessly murdered on December 29, 1890. Violence and death again visited Pine Ridge. I won't go into great detail here, but I'm considering doing a video on these events in the future. Suffice it to say that during this period, that is to say, early to mid-1970s. There was violence, and on June 26, 1975, the reservation was the site of an armed conflict between AIM activists and the FBI and their allies, which became known as the Pine Ridge Shootout. Two FBI agents and one AIM activist were killed. So at this point, um, I will return uh, to what uh, Iris had to say in her communication, and again I quote, I was in and out of Pine Ridge to give support, and the police may have had questions on, uh, on said fake shooting or death, but then again, my mother worked at the uh, Windsor Police Station. Visiting a reserve, being assaulted may, uh, may, bring out, may bring out a bear walker, and the spirits that patrol the, on, uh, on an area like that, is, it's, it's rather iffy. As a child, my grandfather told me that we lived in Bear Valley. I thought he meant bear, but he may also have meant mohawk. It used to be 
an Aboriginal long ago, when the English and French were fighting, the English painted the bridge across the North River, uh, they painted it red so that the uh, reverse was split, and the English part, the Aboriginal called it Red Bridge, and the French called it Balsam Creek, and I lived in Bear Valley. Once these non-Aboriginal men were chasing me, and, and I just kept running into the woods, and I saw a bear, and I laid behind it. The bear saw the men and started chasing them. We had potato fields, and the bears would come. I was told not to feed the bears and heard stories of children being carted off by them. And my grandfather even made me skin a bear, and we ate it for many months. It was horrendous. I even smelt like a bear because he would rub bear grease on me with menthol, etc., to keep flies away. To me, bear walking is walking next to the bear when it is, in, is the hunter or when it is the protector. And I think it was the protector. Alberta, um, that wanted to find me for killing 1,000 grizzlies, <laughs> I may have killed two or, or four, but the aboriginals killed the rest. I was scared about something once, and I went camping in my car in the woods, and when the, the bears came out and rubbed against the car, I felt safe. What do you do when seeing a bear walker? Walk backwards respectfully and keep walking and praying. It seems that spirits do not want to go far uh, from the bones. I'm not sure whose bones, perhaps it is, uh, perhaps it was uh, them at one time. And the flood of the Bible took away their, their forms when the angels married humans and produced half-breeds. I sometimes wonder if the really dangerous and evil-seeming spirits have imbalanced uh, brains, or maybe they were just fearful and want you to go away. They say that sometimes they will live in a thing, like a stove, or a stone, excuse me, or whatever, and, and you took it home with you by stealing it. Best return it. Bears, like cats and dogs, are territorial, meaning they walk the land, thus protector of small animals. A bear with uh, rabies or health problems will be viciously, uh, especially when hungry. People think that the female is the only of the bear that attacks, uh, but when you are near their young, that is. But they will attack strangers much like a dog does. I have a healthy fear of bears, but I don't view them as my enemy. I don't view a spirit bear walker as my enemy. It is usually the heart that responds first to an unseen force. You uh, just, well, you just know that you are invading an area that does not belong to one. Once I visited my mom and my sister, and I slept in the uh, living room. We saw the face of a devil on the wall. I said, it is just the plants, and my mother had three layers of shears on the windows. When I went to put my hand in front of the shadow, all three of the plants fell down. I jumped into bed and covered our heads, and I left the next morning. But the, the police came to ask, uh, ask me, or to ask questions about me, something about me, and I was gone. So was it an angel wanting me to move, to move on? It is very questionable, end quote. Some of this may sound a little confusing uh, to you who, who don't know about bear walkers and skin walkers, but I think that Iris provided a, a unique insight into a culture that the white European mind does not understand. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope at some point there will be more conversation between myself and Iris. You realize this is... Ongoing thing, huh? Yeah, it's a daily thing. I don't... There's times that I just... Nothing else but think about it. Come on, Clint. Don't worry about Clint. He's he's harmless. He's harmless. He's harmless. I named him after Mr. Eastwood. He's a good dog. He's shy now. He used to walk around with his tail up all the time. Since this all started, it's just made him as crazy as me, I guess. Up until recently, Thomas has lived a happy and normal life. It all changed when he allowed a man, whose name will be withheld, stayed in his home. This guy that I know uh, got out of prison. Didn't know where he's at afterwards, after he got out of prison, but eventually he worked his way to Oklahoma and needed a place to stay. So he ended up coming here, staying with me. I was kind of reluctant to let him stay here. I guess within a week, he was out in front with a drum, playing, playing drum, chanting. I just kind of asked him, I said, what are you doing? He said, I learned a song. I kept on, I didn't think nothing about it, just went on about my business. Probably within a month and a half, month and a half, two months, something like that, after he pretty much settled in, 
He's out there, it's like on a Friday, Friday or Saturday night, and he's out there and he's really getting it. And you can tell how he was doing it, that he was doing something and he was really, really vocal and like he's almost in a trance, basically. Like an incantation or ritual. That's what I got out of it. He's playing the drums right there, about where he parked the car right there. Had the drums right in here, underneath this tree. I didn't really think anything about it because I had a few beers in me, so I just went ahead and went to my truck, kicked on the radio, and didn't think anything about it. So I ended up uh, needing to go to the restroom, so I come in the house, and then when I come back out, he had stopped, and he, he was just basically just looking back south. And I kind of glanced over that way, and I seen a couple of a couple of eyes, basically, what I saw. And I seen that. Whatever it was, just right in here. That's where you, that's yeah. Where you saw the, uh, eyes. The, the eyes was right in here. As I was walking up, as I looked this way, that trailer wasn't there. As I was walking up, I could see it. Like that. I mean, just, I mean, it's glowing. You couldn't miss it. So I walk up, and I got my hand over my mouth. It's like, I didn't even have to say anything. He says, you see it, don't you? I said, yeah, I see it. And that was the end of the conversation. He stayed with us maybe 10 times off and on, always getting in trouble, telling him, hey man, we're gonna bring laws into my house. And wouldn't listen to me, just come and go. Big pig, we had to run him off, throw him out. So eventually, just probably within the last month, that he come over and wanted to stay here. And I, I told him, I said, you can't stay here. He, Went to, right off on his bicycle. And when he stopped and turned and looked at me, it was like, hey, I'm gonna get you now. He said that, or no, he, the was, look he gave you? Look he gave me. Okay. According to legend, when a Native American is close to death, the spirit of a bear walker can possess the body of the dying person. Once possessed, the bear walker must kill one person per year or the vessel will die. Thomas tells of how a bear walker spirit is now threatening him and his home. The following day, he was in the emergency room and had a metaphylite him out. He had had an accident and hurt himself real, real bad. Didn't think anything, you know, I hoped he's okay. That was about it. But then, here within the last week or so, well, actually, in the last couple of days, I hear a bear at the back door there and just snorts and send chills up and down my spine. And legend has it that it's called a bear walker, half man, half bear. Everything pointed to him. It always just turns around and goes right back to him. So I'm, I'm sure that's who it is. I had my choice, I'd shoot him in the kneecap and beat the dog shit out of him. And that's a dog, that's the truth. Because he is a conniving son of a bitch. Coming after me, basically, what I'm thinking. Can't be trusted, and he's, he's bad. I ended up getting this feeling about the woods over here that night. Got the phone, turned it toward the woods, sun setting, and kind of hang around for a minute and then come in the house to let it sit out there. And what this is really weird. You can hear in the distance like a low, like a growl of a bear. When it gets real close, it you can hear the breathing, just like an eerie noise with it and the growl seemed like it was kind of hollow in the distance and then you can hear a tree starting to the like a twig snapping and just and all of a sudden just falls in the distance but you can hear like the breathing of a bear it seems like it's getting closer and closer and then nothing and then seems like the the audio just goes out completely silence and then all of a sudden just jump back in. You can just, you can hear it on the, on the tape of it. Thomas allowed me to share the audio that he recorded that night. 
What you're about to hear is an unedited recording of what Thomas has just described. Listen for the sudden change of audio at the end, as well as the sound of wood being splintered. You realize this is ongoing thing, huh? Yeah, it's a daily thing. I don't. There's times that I just nothing else but think about it. The bear walker legend comes from the Lakota tribe of South Dakota. Thomas explains how the man had lived and studied with the Lakota tribe before he came to Oklahoma. And I got to check it in to uh, myths and legends and stuff from that certain tribe. And he studied with that tribe before he come down here. That's how I know all that other stuff. So I, that kind of leads me to believe that's him. Thomas has found several footprints in his backyard, footprints that he cannot explain. He has made castings of these prints and show me several of his findings. One in particular is unexplainable and disturbing. The casting shows the front claws and pad of a bare foot. The pad of the foot continues back and slowly takes the shape of a human heel. It does have the bare foot right here. You see the claws back down this way. And then you can see the back pad of the bear right here. But what's weird about it is how this right through here all this kind of just ties right back up into it. And it's got the shape of a heel of someone. I found the prints underneath right here. Over here in the dirt. Yeah, he's been digging a hole and now it's just pretty it's, much, yeah. But the, the prints were under this Yeah, carpet. it was actually like one right here or right in here. The other one was right along here. And then the other one seemed like it was right along here. Thomas has no explanation for these sounds. He took me into his woods and showed me a fallen tree behind his house. The tree was splintered as if it was snapped like a twig. There were no signs of it being felled by a lightning strike as there were no scorch marks of any sort. The tree I'm talking about is right here. If y'all come this way, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. It is just totally snapped and I don't know why. That looks, I've never seen anything like that. I've seen lightning hit a tree and it peels it back 
but you can see it where it comes down to where it jagged basically so i don't i don't know that right there is like somebody snapped it like a toothpick to me and we've had some wind come up but i'm not man i don't know i really don't know and that kind of gets you exactly where i'm at today i wanted to get a hold of you and tell you my story because i don't know something happens to me at least it's out there i'm all i'm all about having some evidence because i i want to know myself be careful, everyone, when you're going out into the woods. Same sub, different email. Very interesting email, this one. Hey, Jeff, I sat down tonight and tried to remember everything my dad had taught me and my siblings relating to the bear walker and wrote a basic description out of memory. My dad passed away back in 2010, and since everything in our Ojibwe culture is taught and passed down orally, I'm unfortunately only as good as my memory now. Yes, you can start feeling senile at 38. So anyway, here goes. The bear walker, or the makwamosa. I know how to say the word, but not spell it, lol. Was said to be a bad woman or man who decided to use the medicines and rituals of the Ojibwe in a corrupted way to gain personal power and or to extract revenge or get another native that they were upset at for whatever reason or jealousy of. That person who wanted to become a bear walker would have to perform a blood ritual of some sort by praying and calling on Jai Mandu, our word for the devil that basically means dark or evil spirit and making an offering of their own soul and life as well as some blood. Not sure, but possibly their own, as well as an offering up something belonging to the intended target, like some of their hair or something like that. If their offering is accepted, then this would call up the spirit of the bear walker, and it would possess them for the rest of their life, giving them immense strength and longevity, as well as the power to cause sickness, misfortune, or death to whomever they wanted, as well as travel disguised as any animal or as a ball of flame. The form of the bear was chosen most often, though, to keep and build this power. The bear walker was expected to take lives and then to take a small piece of the body of their victim and offer it to the Jai Mandu, some people also say that this could have been done to prevent the victim's spirit from getting revenge on the bear walker who killed them. For this reason, as part of any Jibwe wake, the body of the deceased is constantly guarded by the family until the burial that occurs at the end of the traditional four-day Ojibwe mourning ceremony. In the olden days, for added protection, the body would be rolled into a blanket, lied on a platform high off the ground, while it was being guarded, in more recent times, however, the body is guarded indoor. I helped with this in an alter alternating shift with my younger brother during my father's four-day ceremony after he passed. We believe that it takes a person spirit four days, which is a sacred number to us, to travel the spiritual road with our guides on the other side to atone for anything we may have done wrong or anyone we may have hurt during the course of our lives. When that is done, we believe that you are able to then go be with our ancestors and loved ones and the Creator. It's also said that the only way to stop a bear walker is to kill it. There is actually a guy in Canada who was acquitted of murder because he believed that the man he beat to death in his yard during an altercation was a bear walker who was trying to kill him. Locals backed him up because before the guy got killed, he had been bragging around town that he was a bear walker and he was going to kill a bunch of people he had beef with or possibly even their children so that they'd really suffer from grief. He got beat to death with a petrified walrus penis. Karma. I don't remember how much more than that, but... I do know that locals from my old hometown and the rest of the Upper Peninsula who were interviewed for a book that I told you about, 
had shared their family stories about stuff with bear walkers so that it could be taken seriously as warnings to others. Unfortunately, from what I recall from reading the book, it ended up being marketed as satire or funny mythological stories. I know most of the family names through the Ojibwe who contributed stories from my area and related to some of them. And I know they told these stories as what they consider to be fact. The Ojibwe sense of humor is super dry, but we never joke around about stuff that dark. Everything is shared as a lesson to be learned and passed along to the next listener. Oh yeah, I did manage to find the book on Amazon, so I'm going to send you a link. I think you would enjoy it and learn a lot more about the subject. I hope this helps. If you have any other questions or anything, just hit me up. It's called Bloodstoppers and Bear Walkers is the name of the book. Bloodstoppers, Bear Walkers, Folk Tradition of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I was part of a team of wildlife researchers that were trying to get some research done for a hunting periodical. The project took us to Texas Hill Country where there are more species of deer than I have personally ever seen before. We entered a cluster of birch trees that was just big enough to pass as its own little forest. We staked out there for a while to see if any good opportunities would present themselves. We didn't have to wait too long. Two large box ran out of the thicket like speeding trains, one on the heels of another. As if on cue, they turned to each other and began clashing their antlers. We couldn't have scrambled faster. We were all stomping over each other, watching the amazement unfold. Just as both bucks were locked like two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, a mountain of a shape emerged from the trees coming toward the combatants. This wasn't like your traditional animal. It was walking on two legs, just like you or I, but it wasn't human. That's the problem. The people whom I've told this to, albeit very few, suspect that I saw a Bigfoot. But it wasn't a Bigfoot. My best descriptor would be a grizzly bear on steroids. But I feel like even then, that's just scratching the surface. I felt like the beast was the size of an entire barn. Although that's an exaggeration, it appeared so incredibly large one cannot describe. It lumbered over to the two bucks and grabbed both, pulled them apart from each other like it was tearing a sheet of paper in two. The speed in which it emerged from the woods to coming right up on them was almost breathtaking. The shrieking of the two bucks was terrible. One of them lost its head due to how interlocked its antlers were with the other. Then this massive mutant bear began eating them as casually as either you or I would eat a couple of apples. We took in the entire thing. We didn't make too much noise or movement until it had decided to wander off so as to not put ourselves on the menu. I was a little more optimistic than the others about just seeing something. But after a late night of hitting the bottle together, we woke up to find the truth had been more than alive. There were tracks all around our campsite nearby of this thing's massive footprint. They were indeed bare, but nearly double or triple the size. I'm talking massive prints. There are definitely monsters out there that clearly defy explanation. And in places like out here, you would think everything has been seen. How some of these creatures remain hidden, I have no idea. I would have thought this was Paul Bunyan if it didn't have so much hair. I'm thinking about going to the same location again by myself to see if I can somehow see the same creature. We might have walked away with nothing to show for our efforts, but the whole thing made a believer out of me and that things beyond the realm of this reality truly exist more than we'd like to accept. 
I've never been an experienced outdoors person, and I made the mistake one summer to go camping by myself when I encountered something I was not prepared for. I always knew I should have never gone camping alone, but I did it anyway, like I was trying to prove something. I made a major mistake, of course, being a rookie and being so nervous about it. I forgot one crucial thing. Shelter. I packed my backpack with enough food and water, but I forgot my sleeping bag. I didn't want to turn around and call my friend, telling them I was too scared to camp. So I just decided I would just find some leaves and make a makeshift bed. I did have a small tent, so I guess I did have shelter after all, but I needed to do something. So getting nervous and trying to calm myself down about what I was going to do in this strange predicament, I decided meditation would be my best takeaway. So I found a nice spot and sat down for a while and tried meditating. I had come all this way and made all this time sacrificed. I was not going to give up now. This was a nice spot near a large lake. I had a beautiful view and a nice breeze. It was making things a little easier for me. I thought this would be the perfect place to meditate. I sat down, closed my eyes and opened them, and started to meditate again. Just as I had my eyes closed, and I was really focusing in, a very loud crackling sound comes from the woods. This is where the story kind of changes. So I opened my eyes and looked around. I couldn't believe what I saw. Not even 30 feet away from me was this huge black bear. So I sat there frozen, tried to meditate again. I mean, I had no other option. I felt if, like, I were to get up and run away, this thing would have chased me and eaten me. I could feel my heart beating really fast. I thought if I just sat quietly, maybe it would go away. But I was wrong. The bear kept coming closer and closer, and it was making these strange noises, like huffing and groaning. I began to pray to God that it wouldn't come any closer, and I would be okay. I knew if the bear got closer, I would probably have to fight it off with my hands or something, which I knew was not a reality. This bear waltzes right up to me and begins sniffing me, acting very strange. I stay as still as possible, not knowing exactly what to do. I'm sitting there, squeezing my eyes shut, not exactly sure what's going to happen next. And then... This bear just stops, stands up, and I swear to you, this next part is real. I know it's common for bears to stand up on their hind legs, but this thing was standing different than a bear usually does. It was standing more like a man does, and even began chanting, as I recall. The bear began chanting, and I swear to you, I heard a voice say this aloud. It was almost telepathic, because the voice appeared in my head, not audibly. I heard the voice say this, It's not what you think it is. I heard that loud and clear, and I opened my eyes again, and I saw this bear transform into a man, standing there almost like a statue. Now I'm terrified, and in front of me I'm seeing this person, what looks to be exactly like an old Native American man, covered in a large bear headdress with large animal skin draped over him, staring at me. This is all happening really, really fast, and I just don't know what to do. This person or thing just stands there, and I'm frozen in fear, not knowing what I should do. I don't know if it's a dream or what at this point, but I know I'm not dreaming. I know I'm awake. The next thing I know, this thing or person is chanting again, this time louder. And I swear, I hear the voice say again, You have to go. And I had this vision of myself walking off into the woods. And suddenly, I'm back in my tent. I don't know how I got there. But 
I'm actually in a sleeping bag this time, and I see a big sunbeam coming through the tent. I'm sitting up and it was morning time. Somehow, I don't know if I arrived in an alternate reality or what, because somehow I have a sleeping bag when I didn't bring one before. I was completely confused at how it was morning time, early morning, when I was meditating in around the mid to late evening. But all I knew was that I was alive. I didn't know what happened, but I knew I was very lucky. So, taking my chances, I packed up my tent and left. I can't even begin to describe to you just how freaky the entire thing was. I've never been one to hallucinate or just make up stories. Everything I'm telling you is true. I felt that I was very lucky to be alive. I don't know why I was spared. Maybe it was to tell this story. I don't know. I know that I will never go camping again by myself. I used to think it was just a coincidence that I was attacked by a bear and that it was just some animal trying to protect its territory. Now, I believe that I was spared because it was maybe an omen. The Native Americans believed that there were these spirits that lived in the woods. They called them shapeshifters. I believe that that is what I encountered, and that it was some sort of shapeshifting spirit in the form of a physical, large black bear. Why it came up to me, though, and targeted me, I'll probably never know. So, I've been wanting to write into you for a while now, and I encountered something weird and very scary. Like, the weirdest and scariest thing ever, and it kind of messed me up for a while. When I have told other people, they just laugh or shrug it off, give reasonable explanations for what I saw. But, honest to God, I dream about this every damn night. And when I say dream, of course, I mean wake up, drenched in sweat, screaming in terror, every single night. So, let me tell you why. I live in Colorado. In Colorado, we have bears. Black bears. Now, most times, a bear will not come near a human, and certainly won't act aggressively, unless of course there are exceptions. I wouldn't even take a million dollars to face a mama bear getting around her cubs. But aside from that, I kind of figured most people know that. You know the bears are there, and if you leave them alone, they generally leave you alone, right? It's not like they come knocking on your door in the night or anything. At most, they very occasionally nosy their way through trash and even maybe knock garbage cans over. Annoying? Absolutely. Scary? Well, not quite. Again, following the rules and you seem to be fine. Camping? Fine. Just don't leave food outside the tent. Hunting? Great. Just never threaten the mama. You know how that'll end. But you didn't come here for a nature lesson. You want to know why I haven't had a full night of sleep in the last few years. Well, let's talk about that. I work at a hotel, on the front desk. Usually, I'm working second shift, but sometimes I pick up a third. Working through the night isn't the best, but it doesn't hurt once in a blue moon or once in a full moon, as it was this night. The hours were a bit unusual that day too, as the manager needed to be in super early for a delivery, so I clocked off at 4.45 a.m. I downed my cup of coffee and jumped in my car, ready for the 20-minute drive home. I cranked up some loud music, wound down the windows to get some fresh air flowing, and help keep me stimulated and awake. The moon was still very much full in the sky. The sun wasn't due to coming up until around 7.30, which I was glad of at the time, 
because unlike summer night shifts, at least it would still be dark when I hit the sack. I was about halfway home when I saw the bear at the side of the road. Again, not really unusual at that point, nor scary. I've seen plenty of bears and although always respectful, have never been afraid. The closer I got, however, a feeling of ill ease started to spread over me. It's really hard to explain, but I began to feel really uncomfortable. Again, not exactly frightened yet, but definitely uneasy. It was also deathly quiet. Now, I know you're thinking, of course it's quiet, you fool. It's not even five in the morning. But, see, this was different. And then, I saw why. This bear was huge. Now, yes, bears are big, I know that. But this creature was the largest and strongest looking bear I have ever laid my eyes on. It looked like it had been working out, and I know that is not even possible, but I'm just trying to reiterate my point across that this thing was rippling with muscle. So much so, that it looked unnatural. It was also in what I can only describe as a fighting stance, like it was ready to attack at any given moment. Its enormous mouth was open, displaying the meanest looking teeth, and its eyes seemed to glow an unnatural yellow. I know bears, along with other animals, and I know their eyes can reflect off your headlights and even appear to glow a yellow. But this wasn't the first bear I'd seen at night. These eyes were completely different, like they were out of a movie. And besides, my headlights weren't even on it. This bear was lit up by the light from the very brilliant and very full moon, and its eyes were a luminous yellow, glowing orbs almost. I knew in an instant if this thing pounced, if it went for the car, it would rip me to shreds without even trying. Its entire demeanor seemed incredibly hostile. I rammed my foot on the gas pedal and raced out of there. I almost lost control, but at the right moment, I would have honestly taken dying in a head-on car crash over facing that bear. Thankfully, I did make it home, since there was no way in hell I was going to sleep. Once I had calmed down, which was only achieved by downing a hefty amount of bourbon, I began to google, huge bear, yellow eyes, and you know what I found? The legend of a werebear. Let that sink in for a minute. The thing I saw on the road was a freaking werebear. And much like the far more well-known werewolf, they are possessed by bloodlust and don't give a damn what or who they tear apart. I was beyond lucky to escape that night. I now won't work night shifts anywhere even close to the full moon. I'm not 100% certain if I believe the full moon had anything to do with it though, but I would like to think it had everything to attribute to it. My boss, coworkers, even friends and family think I'm a loon, but I know what I saw, and I know what wakes me in terror every single night. Now the real question goes, how do I know it's a werebear, and not just a casual bear? Well. I'm not the best storyteller, and as I'm driving by, this thing stood up. I know what you're thinking. Yes, bears do stand up, but the way this looked was much more human-like than any bear I've ever seen. Usually, when bears stand up on two legs, it's not for super long, and if you even simply google a picture of a bear standing on two legs, well, they simply look like a bear that's standing on two legs. They do not look humanoid in the slightest. This thing, however, besides its rippling body, had the torso and chest of what was clearly defined as a man. Even the legs look different. Bears usually have thick, stubby legs, and this was no bear leg. Although they still look short, 
They clearly resembled a man's legs, with the kneecap and all, everything covered in a light, thick hair. By light, I mean light brown in color. Thick, because, well, bears have a thick matted fur. But even through all that fur, I could still see the definition of its rippling muscles. I'm pretty sure, in all my heart, that werebears are real. I went through a real rough patch, nearly 10 years ago now. It caused me to be homeless for a very short time. Being homeless in the city means plenty of shop fronts to sleep under, cardboard boxes and alleyways, and even communities of other people without a roof over their head. Being homeless in the country means finding a big enough tree in the woods to give you some shelter and finding animals for food so you can actually eat something. It also means that sometimes you witness crazy stuff, all whilst hiding behind the trees. I've seen a couple of go deep into the woods for a special meeting, several times, whilst I know both of their actual partners are at home. I've seen a guy talking to his dog like he's some kind of therapist, letting it all out to this canine doctor, and man, did he have some weird stuff to confess. Kids drinking, people smoking weed, scandalous but everyday people drama. However, one day, I saw something that was about as least as an everyday routine as you can possibly get. It was around early November time, and it was right when the evenings and nights were starting to take their toll. At the time, I'd managed to make myself a sort of den that I'd crawl into, having found various blankets and other stuff that I regularly raided. But it was still pretty freezing out, and I was beginning to worry about how I was going to last all throughout the winter, much less survive with little food. And there was also less food to gather now, too. Several of my buddies seemed to be starting to hibernate, so at least I felt like I had competition for what food was left. I had a little fire going, having just enjoyed some rabbit that I caught. When I heard the sound of something moving really fast through the tree line, I usually tried to put the fire out, or at least cover it, so I didn't draw any attention to myself. But there was no way. Whatever was trampling through was a person. It sounded big, and animals usually don't come near me if they see fire. There aren't many predators out there, but I wanted to be prepared. The crashing and banging of this whirlwind was coming closer and closer when it came to an abrupt stop not too far away from where I was, settled in for the night in my little den. I could see just by the light of my fire a huge figure of some sort of creature. It appeared to be standing up on two legs, but also appeared as if it was in great pain, and it was flipping its great mass all over the place. I heard it howl and growl, and for a second in the light, I could just make out what it was. It appeared to be a bear. Now I was worried, as this beast was clearly rabid or diseased from the way it was acting. I just stayed very still, glad I was still partially hidden by my den and the trees I was around. I considered extinguishing the fire again, but decided not to draw any attention. And then, in the dull light of the flame, something even scarier had happened. I watched open-mouthed and trying my best not to scream or throw up as the bear seemed to shed its skin. The low light only allowed me to see so much and I was grateful as the whole process appeared barbaric. Bones breaking and shattering, skin tearing, the bear screaming simultaneously Thank God it only lasted for a few moments. And there, stood exactly where the bear had been, not even moments before, was a man, naked, dropped to his knees, and panting. He was back up, and never made a sound. He eventually got his breath, 
jumped up and ran off. I didn't recognize him, but then I only saw him from the back and in such faint lighting from the fire. Plus, I was in shock from what I had just witnessed. I'm not sure I would be able to process this if I knew him or not. I've heard about werewolves, seen plenty of movies, and those movies also showed the whole man-to-wolf transformation. What I think I saw that day was reverse. It appeared that I saw a werebear turn back into a man, and it was every bit as horrific. I understand this sounds absolutely crazy, and probably fictional, and I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined this being remotely true, but I can't deny the truth of what I saw. My guess is that there was some serious black magic or curse involved. It's the only way to explain such a bizarre, supernatural phenomena. Now another method of transfer of power was related by Archie Magintrump from Michigan's Upper Peninsula to Richard M. Dorson in his book Bloodstoppers and Bearwalkers. He related, and I quote, You can catch one if you have the right medicine. You chew a sprinkle of the medicine, uh, you chew and sprinkle the medicine on yourself, and you wait for a bear walk. Then you put your arms around it, and it's all naked except for a string of beads around the neck. Then it asks you to let it go, and it promises you anything to suckle you, to teach you the bear walk. Then if you let it go, you go and learn from it, like from a professor. They caught one here once that way. I'd like to be a bear walk, he said. If you shoot them, you can't ever catch them. You can't bring them to your premises, and they must always go home to die. You don't find anything when you shoot them, but they die off some distance." End quote. Chief Nagagwin related uh, that among other things, the person with this power can transfer themselves into any shape. Most frequently the choice is a bear. In this form, they stalk forth to revenge wrong do wrongs done to themselves or to kinsmen, and they have tremendous power indeed. If in this form they even pass by an innocent bystander, that person, unless of extremely strong constitution, is knocked unconscious by the sheer power concentrated in this being. <clears throat> Alec Philemon <clears throat> was a personal witness to this incredible concentration of power by which even future events can sometimes be predicted. Philemon related, when I was 13, maybe 14, I was going with my mother and sister to visit a sick woman. We left there about 11 o'clock in the evening and I saw the fire right on the main road, which goes to uh, the church now. My mother and sister fell right over. I caught my mother. She said, that must have been a bear walk. It was much too, it was much, too much for us. And then she said, you'll live the longest. My sister fell first and she died first too. They both died of the flu in 1918. That woman we visited, about a half an hour after we got home, we heard the bell ring. And that woman was dead. End quote. <clears throat> As illustrated in the above story, brilliant lights are oftentimes associated with the bear walker. When a person transforms to the bear and walks upright through the forest, it searches in search of its victims, the, the beast is ablaze with brilliant light. One of the more common shapes to be assumed is that of a huge fireball. Chief Nagagwin recalled one evening watching the barn by his house. I remember going one going down by the woods by my house. You could just see the trees all light up. A lady, Nancy Picard, of French Indian, de Indian descent, related that her father died on the night of January 4th, 1914. She recalled that she had um, that she and various other members of her family saw the Makwamosa light hanging in the woods in the back of the house. She said that it looked like a round ball of light and that some of the family went to investigate. They were so overtaken by the chills that they were forced to turn back, but they all knew of its power. Nancy also told that a person who has the power can take all forms, but the favored form were the bears or owl. Light generally is present <clears throat> with these manifestations. Now I'm going to quote again from Nancy Picard and pay attention in particular to the description of the ball of light. Nancy is speaking about a young girl who took very sick. She related uh, to Mrs. Dorson the following. People watched all day to keep anyone away. Every night they'd see a light hanging in line with the trees and it would dance around like a flame. An old woman, Mrs. Elijah, tried to get it 
to get it, time and time again, when the body was in the house. Dan borrowed money from the Odana, Wisconsin, to contact a person who had power to contract, counteract the evil. He was afraid the whole family would be wiped out, that new medicine was supposed to kill the effect of the original dose. It was quite a notorious affair. Even the white people in the county were interested, she told. Now remember the lights and pay attention to that through the rest of, this account, of these accounts because we'll come back to that in a little bit. When the bear walker makes someone die, the family goes to the grave on the fourth night to protect the corpse, and this also provides another opportunity to end the evil power. The Makwamosa was required to go to the grave four days after in order to get back the medicine that he or she used. On one such occasion, a group of families saw the fireball coming. They were scared and all fainted, save for one old man who, by the way, died, 90, died at 98 years old. He reportedly glanced up and saw the bear stomping on the grave and spitting fire. He is said to have grabbed hold of the bear and it vanished. In his grips it vanished, but in his grips was an old woman bear walker. <clears throat> she was said to have buckskin bags all over her and that she had a bear skin hide on her. It is also believed that whoever the bear walker kills, it must take a toe or finger to put into one of these bags. The desecration of the corpse was further borne out by <clears throat> Archie Meganump, who related the following again in Blood Stoppers and Bear Walkers. If you don't have the right medicine, they put you to sleep, even if you have a gun, and walk right past you to the patient. It's as if you were paralyzed. They go every fourth night, and on the sixth night, the patient is finished. You can be in a room with your wife, and you'll fall asleep, and when the bear walk comes in, there's nothing you can do. You can hear them go out. They can, they can take any shape, fowl or animal, or even insect. That grasshopper you kick may be it. On the fourth night after they kill the patient, he said, they go to the grave, and you can hear the carcass rise right up out of the casket, and they cut off the fourth and fifth finger and the tongue tip and put it in with their victim's set. End quote. The eye, finger, or tongue. It must come from the right side of the victim. If for some reason the Makwamosa cannot get to the grave, <clears throat> it will die after a period of four months. Now, one last eyewitness account is on my desk, which involves the mysterious light phenomenon connected with the Makwamosa. Alec Philemon told that there were three of us, he said, one a couple years older, coming back from Bark River at nighttime. We saw a flash coming from behind us. The older fellow said, it's a bear walk. Let's get it. I'll stand on the other side of the road, and you stand on this side. He continued, we stood there and waited. I saw it about 50 feet away from us. It looked like a bear, but every time he would pass... Or every time he would breathe, you could see gusts of flames. My chum fell over in a faint. When the bear walk was, when the bear walk, all the ground gave wave like when you walk on soft mud or on moss. He was going where he was going. End quote. Now I asked you to pay particular attention to the description of the ball lights. The Northeast Woodlands have always been particularly prone to UFO sightings. Many of these sightings match or are similar to phenomena associated with the Makwamosa. Of course, not all UFO activity in the large area of the United States and Canada can be attributed to this, but it is quite possible that some can be. After all, the bear walk is still commonly practiced but is unknown to most whites. When the ethereal light is seen, the native mind would attribute it to the bear walk. However, UFO would promptly flash into the mind of most modern people. This calls to mind a time when my ex-wife, then fiancé, Kathy and I were driving a desolate stretch of old US-23 near Tuttle Marsh, Michigan. Tuttle Marsh is a good place to stay, away from, um, to stay away from, particularly at night, although I love it there, day or night. We were driving along and observed a bright flash of red light coming from the north, heading south, then arching down into the woods where it hung briefly before disappearing. Not being familiar at that time with the Indian culture, I thought right away UFOs. Now, in 1966, the Native Americans may have been sitting back while having quite a laugh at the expense of the general American populace, which was anxious and nearing panic. But you see, in 1966, the United States was undergoing a truly large UFO flap that seemed centered in the Northeast. You could not turn on the TV or radio without hearing about the phenomenon particularly affected was Michigan and New York. And perhaps you remember. 
At that time in our travel through history, the government felt people were incapable of hearing the truth about UFOs. And come to think of it, years later, not much has changed in that respect, has it? The government, being pressed for an explanation from all around, hired Dr. J. Allen Hynek to play the dupe for them. He announced to the world that the ignorant folk up in the Northeast were seeing perhaps nothing but swamp gas, an explanation that was rejected by most of the thinking public. No satisfactory explanation has indeed ever been published as to what was really being cited. Rather than something from outer space, perhaps it was something quite down to earth which finds its origins in the ancient powers of the Northeast woodlands and in the powers of the mind. Let me relate to you one sighting of hundreds that sound in modern terms very much like the balls of light associated with the Maquamosa. It was on March 20th, 1966 in Southeast Michigan. The Manor family was sitting down to Sunday dinner in their two-story white farmhouse on the Guinness Road. A hollow and a creek separated the house from a 300-acre swamp. And present that evening were Mr. and Mrs. Manners, two of their married daughters and their husbands, and Ronald, Frank Manners' 19-year-old son. They were already seated at the table when the dogs began howling in the yard. Mort Young, in his book UFO Top Secret, published in 1967, best captured the mood of excitement surrounding those events. He reported Manor went outside to quiet the dogs, but they were in a frenzy. A ball of fire arched across the sky. Manor decided it was a shooting star until it halted its plunge in midair just above a cluster of trees in the swamp. Lights flickered at either end of the fiery ball, then it plummeted behind the trees, a ruddy glow marking its location. The rest of the family joined Manor outside. They could see the faint glow, see the brush painted red by its reflection. And without waiting to take flashlights or guns, Frank and Ronnie Manor started down the gentle rise to the swamp. They knew every inch by heart, having hunted deer in it. Frank and Ronnie Manor plodded through the knee-high muck, barely able to see where they put their feet. Ahead, a flickering glow silhouetted a knoll. At eye level, 500 yards in front of them, a football-shaped gray object, the length of a car, shimmered in the darkness. It rusted on a cushion of haze. About eight feet above the mud, the object suddenly burned bloody red, and then the lights blinked out. The incidents of that spring and summer will be long etched in the minds of many. One should not overlook the possibility that at least these sightings had their origin right here on good old planet Earth. Me and my best friend were hunting for something nice and big to put over his fireplace. This thing was large animals. If there was a giant in those woods, he would obsess over finding it and putting a bullet in it and bringing it home and showing it off. Now, I don't know whether or not you agree with trophy hunting or not, but it is what it is. I didn't have the heart to tell him that having a preserved dead body in your home doesn't exactly inspire awe and reverence in others, but oh well. Other than that, though, he was likable enough, just a tad too stubborn. We were in some of the thickest woods that I had ever come across in Montana, and the sun was now starting to go down on us. It didn't help that it was already cloudy. I was about to suggest that we call it a day when he hooted about something he found on the ground. I ran over to see what got his attention, and I swear, I felt a shiver go up and down my entire body. I've seen bear prints. These were bigger. I've seen elephant prints. These seemed even bigger than those. Something had left insanely huge tracks in the scant snow that were titanic in animal terms. My best friend, however, got extremely excited, even more so when the tracks led us to what was left of a deer that had been torn limb from limb. He was in love from that moment on. Anything with that much brute strength and raw power had to end up belonging to him. Me. I was smart enough to get the message that there are simply some things on this earth that you have no hope of overpowering and that you should probably leave alone. You don't try to put tornadoes in cages. He didn't see things that way, and that had been one of the leading differences between him and me 
well over the years. The scope of our prey's strength and dimensions only widened with each new discovery along the trail, picked out by the animal's footprints. Small trees seemed to be shoved aside like they had just been mere sticks in the ground. I personally was starting to wonder if there would be enough physical room in my friend's house for this animal's body. We stepped into a clearing where a great shape lumbered forward on two legs. The monster's entire mass shook as tons of fur and fat and muscle clung to what I can only describe as a towering framework. It turned around just long enough to see it was something was following it. That's when I got a good long look at its face. It was something in the family of bears, but in all my years, I have never seen any kind of bear that looked like that, like it could have won a wrestling match with an elephant. My money wouldn't be on any elephant that went toe to toe with this thing. The horrible eyes, the very fierce looking face, and the fact that it seemed far too comfortable to be walking around on two legs was more than enough to send any opponent into blind fear. All except my best friend. As he was beginning to raise his rifle, I was beginning to question if a 50 caliber would even take this thing down. He raised his rifle and fired without hesitation. The monster winced at the shot. I got smart and I immediately took off running. They say you should never run after a predator, or run from a predator, but I wasn't taking any chances, at least not while this thing's attention was not on me. I watched what transpired in snapshots of looking over my shoulder. My friend somehow deciding one bullet wasn't enough to run. So, the idiot takes a few more shots, one of them getting this thing in the eye, because that was the only shot that made it scream. It didn't look much like the type to think of bullets more than it thought of fleas. It then charged my friend, who firmly stood his ground, getting off as many shots as he possibly could. He must not have known what he was doing, because the bare thing got up to him and had him in its whole mouth in one chomp. It's like he was swallowed. It didn't come after me. I had put far too much ground between me and it for it to consider doing anything. There are people that swear I murdered him. Their explanations for a motive are an insult to their intelligence of anybody. Of course I miss him. Of course it's a tragedy. But it's also one of those things that I've seen coming for a while now. Between the risks that he took and the way he didn't listen to anybody, I knew something like that would eventually come about from it. It is regrettable that I was the one that had to be there to witness this horrible thing happen. I really don't go out hunting these days, part out of respect for him, and partly out of fear of running up against a giant colossal sized man bear. When I was a kid, a group of us went camping, school or church group, something like that which I can't quite remember. Anyway, it involved woods and a river, and a whole lot of water activities like whitewater rafting. It was great fun, good times, apart from the last night. We'd been warned about the wildlife and of course, there were plenty of adults there. The exact camping area we were in was pretty secure but there was an occasional bear sighting here and there. Mainly if you left some food out, they might come nosing about. I had seen one particular bear a couple of times in the distance when we were doing some of the water activities, namely kayaking. What struck me about him was his coloring. I thought that bears were solely black, or at least a dark brown. This one was kind of a light gray, very unusual. I never saw him close to the camp. He or she was always off in the distance. 
It was on the very last night that I got to see him up close. I must have had too much cocoa by the fire. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night, desperate to go to the bathroom. And I didn't want to have to go too far since it was so dark. I didn't have a flashlight or anything, so I just headed over to the trees, just behind the tents. I kept thinking of the girl's tent hearing me, so I ended up going a bit further. Just after I finished peeing, I heard this noise coming behind me. I crouched down, avoiding my own urine, even though I wasn't doing anything wrong. But it's embarrassing, and I still didn't want to get caught. And that's when I could see the outline of a person and it kind of looked like one of the park ranger guys who we'd seen wandering about sometimes, who'd also warned us about leaving food and trash outside. He looked like he was off somewhere in a rush, and then all of a sudden, he bent over, and that's when this began happening. His whole body seemed to shake, like he was having a seizure. That's when I was frozen on the spot. Suddenly, in this horrific moment, he just seemed to change. I don't know what I was looking at. It was also super dark, with just enough light from the sky. Then, once his body had started to slow down from shaking, I realized what I was seeing. I couldn't understand back then, and to be honest, I'm still not even 100% sure, even to this day. As the ranger had turned from a regular old dude with grayish hair, to the bear that I kept seeing. Once he had fully transformed, he went off running further into the trees, and I went back to the tent, where I did not sleep for the rest of the night. Of course, when I told the other kids in the morning, they thought it was the best story ever. I was just glad we were getting ready to go. Once we were all bundled back into the bus to leave, the warden comes up to say bye, and he looked me right in the eyes, as if he knew, and told me personally he hoped we'd all be back very soon. I never went back, but the thought and image of him shape-shifting into this bear never has left my mind. There are many things to be wary of when you go camping. We had the bug spray. We made sure the campfire wasn't too close to the tent, and then made sure afterwards that it was properly extinguished. We cleared all traces of food and threw it in a garbage can that was far enough away from our home base. We didn't have anything other than essentials and for sure didn't bring anything remotely valuable with us. We weren't near any cemeteries, old Native American burial grounds or mental hospitals. We were near some woods as that was where this particular campsite was located. But, we had checked for any animal attacks and there hadn't been any sightings of wolves, bobcats, bears, or anything bigger than a bunny in decades. It was just the two of us, my fiance and I, and it was perfect, safe, a wonderful little getaway. Feeling pretty tired out of the day of exploring the local area and the fresh air, we ended up hitting the hay pretty early on. It was already getting dark, and I knew I'd be asleep as soon as my head hit that pillow. We kept a lamp on the inside of the tent. It only emitted a very dull light, but it was enough just to be able to see our hands in front of our face kind of thing. As predicted, I dozed off almost immediately whilst Jen read for a bit on her Kindle. It felt like I'd literally just closed my eyes when she roughly shook me awake, but at the same time placed a hand gently over my mouth with one hand, the other over her lips making the shh sign. Now you know what it's like when you've been asleep for maybe 15 minutes and then you are pulled out of it, abruptly. I didn't have a clue what was going on, or why she'd woken, and it took a shed load of effort not to simply close my eyes again and fall right back asleep. 
But then I heard the noise that I presumed must have frightened her, enough to wake me, and I was now up and alert. What is it? She mouthed. I shrugged my shoulders and listened very carefully. I could hear a low growling, followed swiftly by a mighty, powerful roar. Okay, I was pretty sure I knew that sound. A bear. A darn bear. That was what I remember thinking. I wasn't particularly scared. More pissed at this point. You see, Jen is scared of everything and superstitious as hell. Hence why we did so many damn safety checks and why I spent hours of research to make sure this area was a safe bet. I could feel her shaking, and sure enough, tears were rolling down her face as she did her very best not to scream or draw more attention to us. Just before I thought to turn off the light, we saw a shape in the form of a large shadow. Now, I know how you make a shadow puppet, and I also know that light and shadows can massively distort the size and shape of things, but... Whatever the hell was out there was abnormally huge. I shut the light off quickly, hugging Jen tightly and beginning to panic myself. I was no bear expert other than recognizing that growling from a roar on TV documentaries, but I didn't think they were quite that huge or would they walk around on two legs and look like that. It gave another horrendous sounding roar like there was a lion or something. Honest to God, we were both shaking in fear. It sounded angry. It sounded violent. And then it turned and looked into the tent. Now, you might be wondering, since it was pitch black and the bear was outside, how the hell did I know it was looking in? Well, I could see its eyes. I could see two bright red eyes shining through the thin material of our tent. It gave off one final roar and then seemed to trail off and trample, pounding the ground with each footstep. I'm certainly no expert, but I'm pretty sure that bear's size and gait don't match up to that. This thing ran on two legs. At least that's what it sounded like, and it was heavy. After about 30 minutes, I finally switched the lamp back on and braved unzipping the tent just enough to see if we were truly alone. We were, but that didn't mean we got a wink of sleep after that. We would have packed up the car and hightailed it out of there if it weren't slightly concerned that it might attract the attention of whatever that thing was. Of course, once the sun rose and we were pretty sure our visitor wasn't coming back, I got in the neck from Jen too, because it was obviously my fault that I hadn't thought to check the lunar cycle, despite her being the one who was superstitious. Because last night, well, I didn't see it, but supposedly was a full moon. So what was our visitor? Once we were home, I checked again for reports of wildlife in the area and came up with nothing. It was only when I did a bit more digging, like three or four pages back on the search engine, that I came across something on many different cryptid websites. Not that I believe any of this crap, or even the whole full moon nonsense, but it did make me wonder. One of the stories in particular stuck with me, and that was the supposed legend of a werebear. I don't know how much I really believe of it, but I saw a very large shape that did not look like your typical, what people would call a werewolf or any other sort of animal that would stand upright. When I say huge, I'm talking easily nine to 10 feet, like a giant football player, a linebacker with a massive bare head and those two glowing red eyes. It was like something out of a Stephen King movie even its growling and raspy breathing was more than enough to scare the crap out of both of us. 
My family are originally from Russia. My grandparents have some incredible stories about the old land, as they refer to it as. One of my favorites was about an elder who lived in one of the villages, who everybody was afraid of, as they believed he had the power to shapeshift and transform into animals. Wolves, bears, you name it. But he had a primary liking to shapeshifting into a bear, or what we call a werebear, as Western culture realizes this. Since this particular legend was meant to have happened centuries ago, it obviously wasn't any proof other than the word of mouth retelling this story over and over. But my grandpappy also believed that he had seen this famous werebear, because just like their lichen counterparts, they are immortal unless they are killed in a very specific fashion. And this one was still around when my granddad was just a boy. Just like a vampire, I guess, the man would walk about in the daytime and appear like anybody else. I guess he must have moved around a lot as to not cause suspicion, or maybe he was just awesome at disguises. Anyway, when Grandpappy knew him, he was still something of a loner, a village weirdo, a large lumbering man who was good at manual labor, but not much of a conversationalist, which seemed to suit him fine, as he was able to keep to himself without drawing too much attention. But of course, that kind of man does attract a certain attention, that of children who like to dare each other to do stupid stuff, like follow the funny man one evening and see where he goes, which was exactly how it came to be that my own grandpappy followed him into the woods one evening after having been dared by a group of older boys. Being nearly 100 years ago, there were no streetlights, not in a tiny rural village in Russia, anyway. But thankfully, it was a full moon, so the light of the moon gave enough light. He said that he followed the guy right through the wilderness until he got to this sort of shack. My grandpappy was about to run back and tell the boys when the man ripped open the shack door and began screaming. Of course, the most sensible thing to do right then would have been to run far away. He just clung to the tree and prayed this giant of a man who was madly screaming and howling was maybe just having a mental break and needed to go out there and let off some steam. All of a sudden, he heard this terrible cracking sound. Cracking and screaming. He just stood there, terrified and mesmerized, as this huge hulk of a man changed from a man to a bear. A huge, hairy, massive, powerful man-bear with ginormous paws and claws. It began howling and stumbled off, smashing through brush. Once this thing had run off, my grandfather raced home, flooding with tears. He said he never told the other boys or anybody what he'd seen. He was simply too afraid, as if somehow retelling the story would make it all too real. But he made sure to never go anywhere near that man again. And that's my grandfather's story. He's always been pretty upfront with me about how real it was, and has never lied about it. Now, could that have any correlation to modern day werewolves or werebears? I don't know. I like to think of it that he was cursed.